proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Air Force to bring you this story. As proudly we hail the personnel of the Air Research and Development Command, and particularly the men and the women of the Air Force Cambridge Research Center. Our story today is called Threading the Needle, and it's the story of Technical Sergeant Tom Giddings and Airman Second Class Janet Bell, and a project they worked on called Volscan. We'll hear about this in just one moment. But first, many times a man is skilled in a particular job, yet he's unable to find a use for it. Has this happened to you? Are you a service veteran with a service gain skill that's just going to waste? Well, if you are, then you listen, because you may be able to put that skill to work as a member of the United States Air Force. The Air Force needs experience and know-how gained in all the armed forces. If you possess one of the critical skills needed to keep America's air defense strong, you can put that experience to work in the Air Force and do so at a higher grade and with higher pay than you may realize. For full details, you write or visit your Air Force recruiter. Ask for the prior serviceman's folder. This folder will show you why. Today and tomorrow, you're better off in the United States Air Force. The serious side of this story is based on the problem of air traffic, which is not a simple one. I had that demonstrated to me a few years ago when I visited the Appleton Air Force Base. I was in the traffic control center trying to find out from the air controller just what went on there. It was a busy place, and even with the help of the operator's explanation, it seemed pretty complicated. You see, the planes call in their positions, and they're plotted on radar. And then I have to tell them the course they should follow to avoid a mix-up with another plane. Mm -hmm. Tell them what direction, altitude, and speed they should travel. Now, for instance, that blip on the radar scope right there. Now, that's 72901. It just called in that it was in the holding pattern at Live Oak Intersection at 7,000 feet. Yes, yeah, so then what? Well, so then I answer, like so. Air Force 72901, this is Appleton Radio. Have you in the holding pattern, Live Oak Intersection 7000, expected approach time at 45. Well, that takes care of him for a minute, but you seem to need several hands and heads. Uh, what's that blip there? Well, he hasn't called in yet, but I'll be hearing from him any... Oh, here he is now. Well, he says he's Air Force 84815 over Storyville at 21. Uh, that's 21 past the hour to you. Altitude, 5,000 feet. So, well, then what happens? You'll see. Air Force 84815, this is Appleton Radio. Have you spotted over Storyville at 5,000? Remain in holding pattern until further advised. We're stacked up 12 deep here. See, you, you just have to keep track of every plane by radar and radio until it lands or is turned over to the tower at the intended landing field. It sounds simple when you say it. Well, it is simple most of the time. If the ceiling and visibility is good, you... Oh, oh, and maybe you'd like to listen to this. Appleton Radio calling Appleton Radio. This is Air Force Jet 98407 leading F-80 Blue Flight. Request permission to land over. Air Force Jet 98407, this is Appleton Radio. Go ahead. Appleton, this is Air Force Jet 98407. Blue flight is four planes. Destination Peterborough. Running too low on fuel. Now over Live Oak in the section of 10,000. Well, this is going to cause complications. Well, why? Four more planes? Well, it's more than that. Those F-80s are jets shooting stars. And they can't be stacked the way the other planes are. Besides which, they're low on fuel. You see, they'll have to be brought in now, and the others will just have to wait longer. Air Force Jet 98407, Appleton Radio. Have you plotted now? Appleton Radio, this is Air Force Jet 98407, leading blue flight. Request immediate landing instructions. Air Force Jet 98407, Appleton Radio. We're stacked up here, but we'll clear a space for you at once. Turn west to a 270-degree heading. Start let down now at 1,000 feet a minute. Call upon reaching 8, 5, and 3,000. Out. 
that's the way it was a few years ago. That's the way it is now in many places. The aviation industry, and particularly the Air Force, was faced with a crisis. There were too many planes in the air, and there wasn't room for them all when they started to come in for a landing. In Washington, the problem was talked over at a meeting of the Air Navigation and Development Board. This is a group that was established a few years ago to develop a common civil military system of air navigation and air traffic control. Reading from the minutes of the meeting, a military representative said, I think it's our problem, a military one. Our planes fly faster. We fly in groups, so we have many planes wanting to land at the same time. A civilian representative said, Our civilian planes are slower and can be scheduled more easily, but even so, they arrive from many different points, and there are logically popular hours of arrival and departure which crowd the landing areas. A military representative said, Unlike ground traffic, we have to keep moving. We can't stand still. We can't park and wait. A civilian representative said, there may be as many as 25,000 planes in the air over the United States on any one day, and every plane that goes up comes down. And there are more aircraft in the air every day. And a larger percentage of these planes are jet propelled. There was the problem for everyone to see. It was talked about, thought about, worried over. Various plans and ideas were considered. Finally, the problem was turned over to the Air Research and Development Command. They were told, here it is. Do something about it. that's how it was. Me, Technical Sergeant Tom Giddings, United States Air Force, made a dope by a babe named Janet. <laughs> that's just like him. Yeah. I hear the same story all the time, except for my dolly. Must be something wrong with her. She's just got eyes for me. Well, I guess that takes care of that. You can't get them like that anymore nowadays, so from now on, I am staying away from dames. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, for one thing, I'm being sent to this research laboratory as an instructor, and there won't be any women around. Oh. I'm going to keep busy, and I won't have anything to do with them. Where are you going? From Boston, they told me. Uh, that is uh, Cambridge. Good. I'll be seeing you around. I'll be at Westover. You'd better explain it to me as though I didn't know anything about it, which is close enough to the truth. I know that you men here at the Air Force Cambridge Research Center have been working on a method for scheduling a large number of planes so they can be brought in for a landing in a hurry. I've got to write a radio script on the development, Major Andrews. You promised to help me out. All right. The present system for bringing in planes using radar and radio equipment is still based on human abilities and capabilities. A skilled team of manual operators with cool heads and lots of experience is able to direct the landing of about 40 aircraft an hour for a short time. And that isn't enough. So we've come to the conclusion that the bottleneck is to be found in the human factor the limit of the normal brain to take in and act on large amounts of information quickly and without fatigue. Now, if the brain is the problem, then our brain should be able to solve the problem, and we think we can do it by using electronic calculators to do a lot of the work. Well, that certainly seems sensible. The whole idea, you see, is based on locating the planes in the air, keeping track of their position and calculating their course and speed electronically in such a way that the planes can be directed safely and quickly to the landing. And we think we're getting the problem licked. Well, if you can do what you say without too much change in the present procedures, I should think you're on the right road. Our system, which we call Volscan, is designed to use the regular air traffic control radar, AN slant CPN-18. This shows on a radar scope the positions of all the aircraft in the area. An operator using a specially designed instrument that we call a Volscan light gun isolates each radar blip representing a plane. The burden is then taken up by the ANTRAC unit, an analog channel tracking device which transmits its information to DATAC, the instrument which continually computes the plane's present and future paths so as to bring it to our screen without interference. I think I follow you so far, but well, how will the rest of it work? I mean, once you have all this information worked out, then uh, there are several possibilities. The plane's heading can be transmitted to the plane by relay men, by our voice radio, or automatically by data link to show on the plane zero reader if the plane is so equipped or it can be fed through a coupler directly into the plane's autopilot well, now let's see suppose a number of planes are approaching for a landing from one direction and some other planes have already been given their instructions now, won't there be a duplication in paths no no once the blip is singled out by the light gun it in effect puts a fence around that plane until the plane has reached an entry gate 
Amtrak keeps track of it until then. When the channel is cleared, Amtrak knows it. The whole system is devised so that each plane that is shot by the light gun is automatically assigned to the first vacant channel. As part of the project, we're prepared to train inexperienced people to demonstrate the simplicity of Volscan's operation. The training will be under the supervision of the sergeant whom we were with this morning, Technical Sergeant Giddings. Oh, I was uh, told I'd find my training class in here. Well, this is room 132. Oh, that's where I was told to be. Oh, you must be Sergeant Giddings, then. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm in the right place. Where's the class? Well, if you're Sergeant Giddings, I guess I'm the class. Oh. <clears throat> All right, class. We uh, have our work cut out for us. We better get to it. W what's the matter? Did you expect a larger class? My other ones are larger. I'm uh, Sergeant Giddings, as you seem to know. Tom Giddings. Airman Second Class Bell reporting, sir. Janet Bell. No, not another Janet. <clears throat> Well, now, as you probably know, we are here to learn about the operation of Volscan, which is a new development designed to enable a large number of aircraft to be scheduled for landing safely and in a short time. Now, what do you know about traffic scheduling and control? Well, practically nothing. I think I must have been chosen to be your pupil, Sergeant, to see if you could teach me. Because if you could teach me, you could teach anyone, or anyone could learn. You know, if you'd said you knew all about it, I'd be apt to argue with you and show you that you didn't. But since you tell me you're ignorant and hint that you're stupid, I'll just have to prove to you that you're wrong. Negative type, aren't you? No, not necessarily. It's just that... Well, I've been in the Air Force for several years now, and I've learned a thing or two in that time. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's this. They do a lot of things I can't understand at the time, but later I find out that they had a good reason for it. Well, I hope you find a good reason for this time. Well, I imagine I will. But before we start, there is one thing we have to get straight. Now, you seem to be my only pupil for this class, which means I'll be seeing a lot of you. Every day, I guess. Now, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's strictly in the line of duty. This is just business, all business. Oh, of course. I might say the same thing to you. We'll probably get to know each other pretty well, but that doesn't mean we have to see each other when off duty. Remember, I'm in the Air Force just as you are, as a career. Well, that's good. That's good. You sound sensible. Now, let's see what we can learn about operating this thing. So, there I am. I come into this room where I'm supposed to teach, and there is my first class for the PPI. One airman second class. But, Frank, do you know what they've done to me now? Well, they've made you an instructor, I would guess. But who is it I'm instructing? A gal, of all things. I've got to teach her how to run some electronic gadgets. Is she pretty? Smart? Oh, well, she's smart enough, and there's no nonsense about her, I'll say that, which does seem sort of strange because she is pretty. Oh. That is, if you like him sort of... Blonde and streamlined and all that. <laughs> and to top it off, her name is Janet. Oh, you're in a rut, boy. Yeah, you can say that again. No, no, you're all wrong, Grace. It's fascinating, just because you don't like anything to do with electricity. But, look, listen, I've only got three minutes on this call. No, no, it isn't a man. That isn't why I haven't been to see you. It... <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of men here, but they're all interested in their work on duty. Mm, well, that's the trouble with them. There's one, though. He's my teacher. He's sort of cute. I've got to show him how wrong he is about girls, particularly those named Janet. Hmm? Uh-uh. No, no, I'm not going to get him with my girlish charms. I'm going to get him strictly on his own terms by being strictly business. It'll take a while, but he'll come around in the end. <laughs> You are listening to Proudly We Hail and our second act curtain in just one moment. Here's important news for all ex-servicemen. You may be qualified to enlist in the United States Air Force at a higher grade and with higher pay than you realize. The Air Force needs men who are experienced in critical skills required to keep America's air defense strong. If you have training in these skills, then the Air Force wants you, and they'll put you right on the job. 
So for full details, you ride or visit your nearest Air Force recruiter right away. Ask them for the folder for prior servicemen. Today and tomorrow, you're better off in the United States Air Force. All right, then, let's go into the theory of it once more. Now, what are you supposed to do, and how, and why? I watch the plane, or rather the blips, on the monitor. Then I use the Volscan light gun and shoot each blip separately. That selects one track for each one on Antrac. Mm -hmm. I can have seven tracks being watched over at once by one Antrac unit, but after seven it won't take anymore, so I have to switch to the next Antrac unit. And what happens if you try to assign more than seven tracks at once to Antrac? Well, it just won't accept them. Mm -hmm. I get signaled that it's full and switch to the next one. But as soon as any one plane gets to the entry gate, its channel is released and I can assign another plane to it. That's right. Then what happens? Antrac follows the plane and works out its position and feeds the information to DATAC, which computes the ratio between the plane's speed and course and the speed and course the plane should have so it'll reach the landing field at the proper time. Uh oh, to delay the plane's arrival, the plane is swung farther away so it'll take longer. Listen, Tom, I know the theory of Antrac and DATAC, but I don't know how that light gun works. Wouldn't it be better if I did know? No, you're right. You probably would be able to do a better job. You see, the light gun isn't really a gun. It's just shaped like one, but it doesn't shoot anything. Mm -hmm. Now, when you want to assign a tracking gate to an aircraft, you point the gun barrel at the blip on your scope. Now, the blip shows brightly for only the smallest fraction of a second, once every four seconds. Now, this momentary flash of light passes down the barrel, strikes a photocell in the butt of the gun, animating the photocell to generate a pulse of electricity which is amplified and applied to an antrac. Now, this puts a fence, you see, around the blip representing the plane and causes Antrac to start following the plane. <laughs> Do you follow me? Well, more or less. Now, this action, for all practical purposes, is instantaneous. Everything has moved at the speed of light and electricity. So the Antrac unit receives a picture of the plane's position, as represented by the blip, and centers the gate on the target. Mm -hmm. Now, the next time the blip appears, Antrac measures the error between the center of the gate and the blip and continues doing this. Remembering these errors for 20 seconds or so, the electronic circuit memorizes a voltage that represents the plane's speed. If the speed of the blip and the gate coincide, the error drops to zero, and the gate stays centered on the moving blip every time it appears. See, that's the way Antrac tracks or follows the aircraft as it moves across the sky, by the blips that move across the PPI scope. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I don't know if I understand it better, but I should. You're certainly very patient. Oh, no, not really. You're a much quicker student than a lot of the kids in my other classes. All that malarkey you tossed me when we first started was just that. Malarkey. Oh, no, it wasn't. I meant everything I said. Oh, come on. You tried to let on you were a little slow or dumb or something. You're not. Oh, that. Well, what did you think I was talking about? It? Oh. Oh, the other will... That was the way you wanted it. I wanted it. You were laying down the rules. Oh, now, look, don't get me wrong. I Is just the meant... lesson over for today? Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Tomorrow? Tomorrow morning. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're through with the theory. Tomorrow, you start with a plane. Roger, you will be landing to the north on runway four, heading 330 degrees. Roger. Heading 330. Start letting down 1,000 feet per minute. Maintain airspeed while descending. Maintain airspeed. Let down 1,000 feet a minute. Roger. Reading 340, you should be passing through 4,000. 4,000 it is. Reading 340. Heading 345. 345. Maintain airspeed, you should be passing through 3,000. Heading 350. Heading 350, 3,000 it is. Heading zero, continue on course. Still descending. Heading zero. Heading zero, 2,000. 2,000, heading zero. Begin leveling, perform cockpit check now. Leveling now. Gear going down now. Heading zero. Cleared to frequency for landing instructions. Out. Roger. Turning to tower frequency now. 
You know, I could follow every step of that on my scope. It's thrilling. Oh, more than that, it works. And so it went. Day after day, landing after landing, with one plane and with many. Checking, testing. Making sure there weren't any bugs to be removed from the system. Rechecking and retesting, so that the performance became semi-automatic. You know, maybe there's something wrong with me, but I find this just as exciting as I did the first time. I wish we could test it on something bigger. Oh, what do you want, a B-52? No, silly. I mean, well, for a long time we tested with one single plane, then with two, and then four. Now we know we can make this work for large number of planes. Look, Janet, we can't recommend this for operational use until we've tried it so often we know it will work every time. But we seem to be doing it under laboratory conditions. We try it under all the conditions we can think of. I know. I know we're trying all different conditions, but these are conditions that somebody has planned. I'd like to see it just once when we have to add lift. Wait, wait, let's leave well enough alone. Jet 59804, do you read me? Air Force Jet 59804, this is Westover Tower. Read you loud and clear. Westover Air Force Jet 59804, request permission to land flight. Mission consists of 10 planes. This is Westover Tower. Where are you, Air Force Jet 59804? Identify. Tower, Air Force Jet 59804, now approximately 80 miles north your station, heading 190, speed 310 knots, altitude 18,000. Roger, Air Force Jet 59804. How's your fuel supply? Tower, Air Force Jet 59804. Have fuel for another hour. We have 10 planes on a test flight, originally scheduled for lowering and main stopover. Bad weather there, and we were advised to try Dow. Dow suggested your base to refuel and wait for the weather to clear. Air Force Jet 59804, this is Westover Tower. We're far from VFR. It'd be more than an hour's wait to sneak in even one plane here, much less 10. I suggest you contact field at Fort Dawes near Boston Harbor. We've got a new traffic control system there called Volscan. Maybe they can take you. Calling Fort Dawes. This is Air Force Jet 59804. Calling Fort Dawes. Do you read me? Over. Tom, what's that? We're not expecting. Air Force Jet 59804. This is Fort Dawes. Read you loud and clear. Over. Fort Dawes, this is Air Force Jet 59804. Request permission to land. Had alternate landing instructions for Westover, who suggested your field and said you had a new method of traffic control. Now, can it take in anyone without special equipment? Air Force Jet 59804, this is Fort Dawes using Volscan automatic control. We'll bring you in. You need no special equipment. It's all here on the ground. Locate. Fort Dawes, this is Air Force Jet 59804 and F-86 at 20,000 feet. Approximately 60 miles west of your station, heading 080, speed 260 knots, the mission is composed of 10 planes. Air Force Jet 59804, this is Volscan, automatic control. Have you in radar contact now. Throughout landing operation, you will be Red 1. Repeat, Red 1. Change radio to secondary 1 and call in. If no answer, return to this primary frequency. Over. Red 1 going to secondary 1. Hello, Volscan. This is Red 1 on Secondary 1. Do you read me? Over. Hello, Red 1. Read you 5 square. How do you read me? Over. Read you loud and clear, Volscan. What now? Red 1, hold heading and maintain 260 knots. We will bring you and the other planes to the entry gate as though we were on GCA. At the entry gate, at approximately 2,000 feet and 2 miles from the runway, We'll turn you over to GCA for final approach and landing instructions as we're socked in. Over. Follow you so far, Volscan. Go on. Over. This may be a different approach than any you have made before. You will be landing to the east on runway 8. Instructions will reach you and the other planes in your mission periodically. Normally, you need not acknowledge all messages, but as this is your first landing with Volscan, you will acknowledge. You and your planes will be scheduled into the entry gate at approximately 30-second intervals. 
So you should all be on the ground within five minutes of each other. Over. Roger, Volscan. Red one ready and waiting. Over. Red one right, heading one zero zero. There will be pauses between instructions to you during which time instruction. Red one, continue right to one six five degrees. Level off at two thousand feet for cockpit check and slow to final approach speed. Roger. Red one heading now one seven five. Red one should be leveling at two thousand. Perform cockpit check now. Check gear down and locked. Acknowledge, please. Over. Gear going down now. Red one heading now one eight zero. Red one now one eight five. Red one back to final heading one eight zero degrees. Change to GCA secondary five and call in for final approach. Control out. Roger. Gear down and check. Switching to GCA secondary frequency five. Listen, after I check in, I'd like to look over your control setup. Out. Glad to have you, Red One. The last one over the fence. They came in exactly 30 seconds apart. Mm -hmm. It was four and a half minutes between the time the first and last plane landed. Well, you wanted to see how this worked under different conditions, honey. Now you know. It works. It does. I aim my little light gun at each blip and... <sighs> Why, Tom, you kissed me. You're a smart girl. You could tell right away. Well, it does work, doesn't it? Yeah. Hey, you didn't aim that light gun of yours at me, did you? I did not. I didn't think I'd have to use electronics to bring you in. No, you didn't. Nothing as fancy as that. Just plain old-fashioned magic. The feminine kind. Well, that's my story about Holstein. A vastly significant development of your United States Air Force to make flying safer for everyone and about a young man and young woman who were privileged to share in its beginning. If you're an ex-serviceman experienced in critical skills needed to keep America's air defense strong, then you're in luck. If you possess one of the skills the Air Force needs, you may be qualified in the United States Air Force and in a grade that'll be a real pleasant surprise. For complete details, write or visit your Air Force recruiter. Ask for the special prior serviceman's folder. See what a return to the service as an airman can mean to you. Today and tomorrow, you're better off in the United States Air Force. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this radio station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center in New York for the United States Air Force, and this is Dick Herbert speaking, inviting you to tune in to the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs> <laughs>